have mercy, look at how the time goes. And welcome everybody to the Coming Home Podcast Seems with John I'm Allen. So I am your humble host. Some would differ with that word humble, but I am your host anyway, John Allen. <laughs> and today I have two fantastic friends of mine, the infamous Miss Tiffany Troutman and, hey. <laughs> and the infamous Mr. Chris Pelser. How are you guys doing? Hello. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know week eight of being in my apartment, so that's <laughs> leading to some interesting conversations with my coffee maker. <laughs> do, do you guys do you guys know any good real estate agents? I was looking to buy some property in uh, in Brunswick, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, too soon, too soon. Too I've, soon, I've man. Heard I've heard some great things. Yeah. Oh for those who can, who don't, for those who don't know me, as we know, this is only an audio podcast. There is no video. I am a black man. And uh, <laughs> there was, um, in, in all seriousness, there was a lot of, um, there is a lot of controversy at the moment because of that uh, shooting uh, mm. where the black guy that was murder. killed. That murder. Yeah, I'm sorry. Don't, let's not call it a, a shooting. It is murder. a murder. Well, I'll take it a step further. It's a lynching. It it's, was a lynching. Yeah. It was a lynching. Absolutely. They hunted him down in their truck. Now, I am, I am mm. a man who, who, you know, I am a stand-up comedian, and I like to put humor on issues that are serious to make people think. And there's been a lot of humor in this house today um, because, in all truthfulness, at one point, my wife, the infamous Snoopy, wanted so bad to live where? Brunswick, Georgia. She really, Shut the front door. seriously, she seriously pushed me hard. She, we were pretty close to actually taking a trip there to look at homes. All the while, I was protesting. She's like, "But it's so beautiful there." I'm like, "Yeah, it's beautiful, but it's in Georgia." She's like, "It looks, <laughs> it looks so peaceful there." I says, "Yes, it does for a certain demographic." <laughs> <laughs> so it it, it I, I don't know it took it took uh, it took what we see on the news today to finally convince her to to <laughs> drop all thoughts of living in Brunswick, Georgia. Yeah, well, oh, I was wow. going to say there's a variety of of uh, you know salves and whatnot you can get in Asia that could help you fit into that demographic. You know, you know they, what? They love their skyliners in Asia, and I'm like, I remember when I would go down to Bangkok, and there would just be these massive billboards for it, and I'm like. This is a thing. <laughs> I okay. I lived on Okinawa for over two years, about two and a half years, and it was very popular to see not not the native Okinawans, but the people who came from what they call mainland Japan, from the main island. Yeah, those people were very into the skin lighteners. It was a yeah. terrible thing to have dark skin. So they 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 worked on the bleaching. <laughs> Come, yeah. Coming from Florida, coming from Florida, we'd had the opposite problem. We got bronzers, we got tanners, <laughs> we got. <laughs> we try to make our skin darker. <laughs> no, so I, 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 I don't know. I, my my facial features wouldn't fit. So even with lighter skin, they would they would still pick me out in Brunswick, Georgia. Maybe yeah. <laughs> you, know, you never know. It's uh, it, you don't know until you've tried, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just go there, you know, give it a shot. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I've wanted to, I've been looking forward to having you two on as guests uh, together because you two are some of the funniest people that I know of on social media. The comments, the posts that you can, Chris, the first time I ever saw anything about you was when you posted that video with the music in the background and you were struggling to eat uh, brown cheese and brown cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Norwegian brown cheese. Yeah. <laughs> the, the infamous brown cheese video. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was actually a time I had been stuck up in Heidal, which for those who don't know, it's literally in the middle of nowhere in Norway. And uh, I had been stuck there for a couple of weeks and uh, the, the music playing in the background was getting to know you. Yes. And I, I was sobbing while eating brown cheese, trying to acclimate myself to the ways of the locals. Uh, yeah. It was a magical time. That is one of the, <laughs> that right there is one of the funniest posts, the funniest videos I've ever seen depicting the struggles of being an American in Norway. It was just a short oh. little five second video, but I thought it was so dull. And I I, I, wa I pull up that video and watch it from time to time just to get a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing being here. That's for sure. <laughs> you, now you've been here how long, Chris? 
Uh, this spring, it's been 19 years now. Yeah, I've been here. I've been here 18 years. It'll be 18 yeah. years in June. Um, what, what do you feel like you have broken the code? Or do you feel like you are you're, you're in there now, or are there any struggles that you have? Because I well, and it, I it, and I ask because it varies. I know people who have been here even longer than 19, 20 years, and they still haven't adjusted. They still haven't tackled the language. They still don't like it. How do you, how do you feel? Yeah, it's a, well, I, I, you know, I, it's a mixed bag, right? You know, and I think that, you know, until I started doing a lot of travel with work about 10 years ago, I was very solidly in the, like, this place is horrible. Why am I stuck here camp? And then, uh, you know, I started going out and seeing other parts of Europe and other parts of the world. And, and then, you know, reflect, you know, I'd come back here and I'd be like, oh, okay, well, you know, it's, it's not that bad. There aren't, you know, random power cables dangling on every street corner, you know, so that's nice. Um, you know, and I think as far as the cultural code goes, I think it's kind of one of those, one of those situations where you you, you figure out your own path, you know, it's like I'm, you know, the people who know me know I'm very loud and very bombastic and, and, you know, very engaged. And, and I think that, you know, in order to make it work in certain environments, I know now how to tone that down and how to make it work in the, in the particular company, but, you know, whether or not you allow that to completely change who you are, that that's up for the individual to decide. I know I yeah. a lot of people who came here and they're just like, I'm going all in. I'm getting the Ola Genser, the, the sweater, you know, I'm eating the brown cheese. Oh I'm eating the small hova, you know, I'm doing oh the whole thing, you know, and, and, it, and I look at them and I'm like, Hey, if, if it works for you, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's an approach. It's a lifestyle choice. Um, but it's not the, the one that necessarily works for me. So. Now, Tiffany, you have some strong opinions about, you know, Chris mentioned, you know, there's some people who jump in and they kind of change who they are. You have some strong mm -hmm. opinions on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, I have certainly strong opinions about it. Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose who I am. I like who I am. I like, I like my um, personality. I like, I don't want to get I lost. Uh, that's, that's what my struggle is. And so I don't want to absolutely change anything about um, my Americanness. I don't want to lose my Americanness throughout this and my Floridaness, you know? So yeah, I have some strong opinions. I do. Now I had a, I had a previous guest, Mike. Um, oh yeah. Tiffany's having uh, sound problems. Um, I had, um, a previous guest, I think it was my last guest or the guest before. Yeah. My last guest, I think, uh, Miss Trisha, the new Orleans uh, musician. And she has some very strong opinions about uh, that whole issue about her Americanness. She is ready to head for the Hills and just turn her back on all things America. Um, and she based that on the government's response to hurricane Katrina in new orleans yeah and i get that and she based it also just on the the general atmosphere um in this country uh what she and many others and myself also to a certain degree uh, interpret as exclusionary as as um uh, an us against them mentality uh, which starts from the yeah. top down it starts from the president and down i mean he's the president has always kind of been the barometer for mm. you know the general atmosphere of our nation. So she took it a step yeah. further and, and her American is not drop that. You know, she is who she is. She's from new Orleans, yeah. but the American part, right. she can, she, she's yeah. Take it or leave it. She'll leave it. Uh, yeah. And I get that too. I totally get that because right now, as it is, uh, I remember the day that Trump became president, you know, the, the election night, that election night, uh, the next day, my friends were having a party and, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't want to have all these questions, you know, from these Norwegians. Yes. Oh, what did you do? What did you do? Kind of thing. So I remember meeting my French friend, Sliman. He met me at the door and he put a Canadian button on me. He said, just tell everybody you're Canadian. You'll be fine. And I did. <laughs> and I, 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 I didn't. I denied Jesus. You know, I did. I did not. <laughs> completely. Because uh, I just didn't want the questions uh, yeah. because. 
you feel like um, they're blaming you, even though you didn't vote that way, you know. Uh, so I do have to be loud about my I I don't want to say I'm anti-Republican because there are no. some good Republicans. Sure, absolutely. I, Trump is not Republican. He's a cult leader. Oh. He is a leader of the, you know, the Trumpists. And it's a completely different genre it's a different animal completely yeah i can i yeah. can i can to tolerate if i can use that word i can tolerate or i won't judge i won't judge anyone's political stance but to me this ugly atmosphere has very little to do with politics and it has to do more with um tribalism well yeah it's absolute tribalism yeah and it's it's sad it's it's i don't know I'm more aware of my Americanness since I've been gone. I'm more aware of my blackness since I've been gone. And I see these things happening back home. And it's almost like you, I end up wishing I could do something about it. It's like, it's like not being at home while your house is burning and you're watching it on video. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh. I think it's, it's a really important distinction, you know, the American versus Americanness, because I think that, you know, there are a lot of qualities of being American that I don't see in Norwegians, for example, that I really value. That for I think example. are great, amazing qualities. You know, like being able to just sit down in a bar and just start talking with someone. Being able a random to random person. Yeah. yeah that, that, you know, that, that you know and of course you get varying degrees of it in the US, but at least in the Northeast where I'm from, you know, there, there is that inclusion. You just sit down, you start talking with someone, you know, and you bring them in and they're not alone anymore for that little snippet of time, unless they really want to be, um, yeah. you know, whereas here you can, you can go weeks <laughs> being out in the world and still not talk to yeah. anyone. That's <laughs> you know? true. I, I, I got to tell you something about that here in, here in Norway, what I miss about being an American or being a, a girl, a female in America <laughs> that we can walk down the street and we can see a random strange woman and go, oh, cute shoes, girl, and then get a high five from them. Thanks, girl. I went to the grocery store and some girl had some nice nails and I said, you know, that's a that's a nice color on your nails. And she looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna come at you, you know, what the hell? So I miss being able to, to have, um, I guess you want to say girly moments with other random females, like a, 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 a sisterhood. There's no sisterhood here. It's not. There's no sisterhood. No. I miss the sisterhood in America where you can just tell a girl she's looking good, make her feel good, even though you don't know her. Nice hair, girl. Hey, you don't do that shit here. And I miss that. And that's a part of the Americanness that I'm talking about. I don't yeah. want to become the antisocial. Don't look at me. I mean, well, right now we're all antisocial, but, you know, <laughs> it has created help in that aspect of the social distancing thing because, you know, ain't no motherfucker sitting next to you on the bus anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Chris, you mentioned uh, you're from uh, you're from the northeastern area of uh, the United yeah. States. What happened to your accent, man? I don't hear it. So so in my attempts to learn Norwegian, I had to learn the letter R. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and and as a result, it just kind of has become this very generic uh, American accent. I see. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the the part of New England I was from, we actually didn't speak that Kennedy Boston accent. We spoke down east, which is roughly akin to being hit upside the head repeatedly by a two by four. It's just so broad and and. <laughs> It's it's it can be difficult to listen to if you if you haven't grown up with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Chris, Chris, I actually I remember hearing a list and they listed uh, all the American accents by the sexiest <laughs> down at the fucking bottom. I'm sorry, the Boston accent was not sexy whatsoever. It was the least sexy, I think. What was the sexiest? <laughs> uh, I I think the yeah. sexiest. One was um, uh, because it was both men and female, uh -huh. and the sexiest was Georgia because they sweet, you know, the Southern Bales, you know, those ones. Oh my, yeah. the one girls and stuff. That so was they'll so they'll charm your pants off before they shoot you in the head. Apparently, in right. <laughs> And if you're, from, if you're from if you're from on land, 
<laughs> well, you know, and if you're from Georgia and you're listening to me, I may not be talking about you, but I am talking about a general aspect of your state. And if you don't like it, which I hope you don't like it, then stand yeah. up and do something. Send some letters to your yeah. governor. Vote, 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 vote. Mm. And but even before the voting comes, I would li- I'm, I'm seeing things being circulated around on social media. People are posting the telephone number to the district attorney in that area around Brunswick, Georgia, so that people can call them up and demand, okay, now they arrested these guys, but they want people to keep focus on this issue and they want to see the right thing being done. I think I read yesterday that they are taking it to the Georgia Supreme Court. Now it's going up to yes. that. Well, the I Georgia think, Bureau, wrong, but, yeah. Well, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations yeah. has now stepped in, so the local law enforcement is out of the picture as well. They should be because I was watching on the news today, and they interviewed the victim's sister and her lawyer, or the family's lawyer, rather. Right. What the local police told this gentleman's mother. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember this guy's this the the, the this guy's name. Uh, yeah, I can't remember his yeah. name. But anyway, the police come to his parents' house and say, Your son has been shot and killed while he was burglarizing a house. That is what was said today by his sister and the family's lawyer. That that is what the police said. My so, jaw is on the damn floor. Well, and, I, and I'm just saying, I don't think that this is that unusual in certain parts of America. I think this happens a lot. And I think the you only... Think? I, I truly believe it. The <laughs> only reason... I'm from Florida. We had, we had Trayvon Martin in my state. Oh, yeah. So, you were being sarcastic. See, I was on my pedestal, so I didn't catch your sarcasm there. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm about to have my first disagreement with Miss Tiffany. <laughs> no, 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 no. We had Trayvon Martin, yeah, so it, it yeah, happens yeah, all throughout the yeah. South. And I think this the is, only reason... that happens, yeah. Well, think about it. The only reason this killing, this murder is an issue right now is because someone vid- um, uh, filmed it. And now we have the video. Yeah. If someone were to describe what happened, most people wouldn't believe it. Oh, you're, yeah. they, you're pulling the race card. You're race baiting. You know what? You, you know what? You, John, I wish people would march in the streets about this, especially white people, my, my fellow Caucasians. I wish people would march in the streets angry like this, as, as angry as they are about fucking haircuts. Well, thank you. And because... Uh, uh, haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> Haircuts. People are marching in the street. I want a haircut. Haircut. (laughs) Where's your sisterhood? Come on. (laughs) Which side are you on here? (laughs) Team. Pick a team. (laughs) No, I um, you know, I started off by putting some humor on that disgusting incident, but I tell you, it really is. It's 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 traumatic for our country. Uh, it's mm-hmm. traumatic if you see it for what it is and you see it for as ugly as a, a, an, an occurrence as what it is, but it's also traumatic if you're too stupid to see what that entire incident represents. It represents such an ugly underbelly uh, of society. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Yeah, not, not, not to dismiss the, the seriousness of, of that, It what it does is it, it just further undermines when good work is done exactly right exactly you know when, when you do have law enforcement that is doing the right thing that is doing a good job and it undermines you know people's trust in that function in society you know it's you know where you know if you're sitting there wondering you know the the viability of your police force when when trying to make a, a report or a complaint you know, then then lots of things start to fall apart, you know, so so the the while this is a horrible incident, it just it ripples out. And Absolutely. Because of, because of of the the velocity with which the story travels, you know, then it has ramifications beyond that that local police force. It, it, it impacts all of it. And, and this isn't a, you know, this isn't a Blue Lives Matter diatribe here but it is to say that you know when you have this happening over and over and over again then you get into the cycle where, where people are like well i can't trust the police so i'm gonna go buy a gun yeah you yeah. know and then you get this kind of lawlessness and then you get the all of these other laws that then get lobbied for you know in these states you know with open carry and you know self defense laws and you know all of this stuff because we've fundamentally not held 
law enforcement to account for their bad behavior. And, and uh, you know, it's just yet another brick in that wall. Yeah. And know? it's a, yeah. And it's a sad it's thing to, thought. yeah, it's a sad thing to see. Uh, you know, I'm, well, you know, I'm, I have a law enforcement background myself, so I'm not anti-police. What I am is mm. anti-corrupt police. I am against anti-racist police. And I would love to mm-hmm. see something. I, I don't know the police unions and the police organizations. I wish they were a little bit more vocal about you know taking a hold of this issue and doing something with it they spend so much time defending the police as a whole instead of stepping yeah. in when incidents like this happen and doing and something about it because it would right. do it would go it would go a long way towards goodwill among the citizens well john can i can i ask you you said you have a, a history in law enforcement can i uh, ask you about the the um entry requirements to becoming a police officer do they have a psychological check do they have you know do they test it because i it's my it's been my experience uh that even just from watching silly movies like a uh, police academy let's just <laughs> take that you have all the different types of cops. You got the sexist cop in there, and then you got the fucking tackleberries. You know, you got the ones that just want their guns and it's the extension of their penis and they want the power. Are they a police officer for the right reasons, or are they a police officer to be manly and have their gun and have the power and have? Is there is there a method that they have in order to weed those out before they become police officers? You know, <clears throat> when I was a police officer, when I applied and tested and was interviewed and all that stuff. This was back in 1996. So with that in mind, there's, there's, I'm sure there's been a lot of big changes. And with that in mind, I would also say, I'm sure it varies from police department to, to police department. There's probably a lot of differences from the state police level to the sheriff's level to the local level. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of variances right. here. But when I went through, uh, if I remember correctly, there were two psychological exams and two or was it three interview rounds two or three interview, just regular interview rounds. So <clears throat> my impression was that they took that hiring process serious. My impression was that they took it, um, it they had a sense of pride. You know, we are a good department. We want to keep it that way. We're going to make sure that the people that come to us are qualified and that they have a moral foundation that matches our moral foundation as an organization. That was my experience then. Then, uh, right. So, so mm. I'll, I'll also say this: <clears throat> we see a lot of these type of incidences with corruption and racism and and an uneven uh, application of the law today. I don't know. I don't know if it's worse. What you laughing at, Tiffany? <laughs> My man just walked. I'll show it to you. <laughs> so he heard that we were talking about the police and he drew a cartman that says, respect my authority. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. I like your, I like your, distract me. I like your boyfriend. Tell him I said, Hey, I do. I salute they him. Like you, that was a good one. He salutes you. <laughs> um, what was I, what was I saying? <laughs> No, I don't know. I don't. I was going to say. Uh, I'll say it more more succinctly. I don't think that police corruption and the negative issues within the police forces is any worse today than it was before. I think it's better documented now. Mm. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah. And maybe that's what it is. That's not. It's better documented because now everybody's got camera phones, and now we hear more about the bad cops. Because there's there are some videos out there about good cops too. Sure. I mean, they're ninety nine percent of the guys I worked, guys and ladies I worked with, were great, moral, upstanding. Right. But, yeah. But the news doesn't show that because no. that's fluff news. It's boring. So if you got to show that's boring, you know, they, you got to show, you know, the bad apples. But if all you're seeing is the bad apples, you think they're all bad apples. Like Chris said, you right, know? Right. Like it's, it, it undermines the, the good cops. They have videos that are playing basketball, the neighborhood kids, you know, it's, 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 it's a terrifying time. That is. But playing the devil's advocate here. <clears throat> um, if the cops are in a, if they, if they're working a, a beat or a district that has uh, high crime numbers, so that most of the people that they run into are, you know, the people who are committing those crimes, 
<laughs> they're only seeing the bad apples of society. What do you guys, mm-hmm. what do you say to that, Chris? Uh, that's a tough one. I think that, you know, it, cause there are lots of, di- you know, I do not have any education or training in law enforcement. So this is all hyperbole. Um, yeah. no, I think that, you know, when, you know, in, in, in general, in any organization, you know, you, you have, you know, your two fundamental tools for guiding the performance of the organization. One is a carrot and one is a stick, you know? And I think that, you know, if you are trying to, you know, encourage particular behaviors, you know, in a group or, a, a, you know, whether it's a, a neighborhood or inside an organization, you know, you, you, you know, if, if your job, job is to enforce that local governance, you know, then you should have, you know, both, both things at your disposal, not just, you know, the stick, but also, you know, are there things you can do to encourage the good behaviors in, in the neighborhood? And, and it's not, and I think it's more than just like giving the, the single mom your card to call if there's something wrong, you know, but, you know, it, there has to be more than just police in a neighborhood to, to make the neighborhood better. You know, I, I was just watching the master class with Ron Finley, um, the gangster gardener down in and how he undertook the greening of South Central. And he was arrested three times, um, mm. had to literally dig up the gardens that he planted because they were against the law. You know, and they tried to pull some zoning laws on him to. Yeah, that, yeah, that. They, they were, they were, you know, it's like you were not allowed to plant on the, the parkway. And it's like, OK, well, what exactly is a zucchini going to do? to South Central that it hasn't already done to itself, you know, you know, it's that kind of thing where it's like, well, which, which laws are you enforcing and why, you know, are, are you in your act of law enforcement reinforcing the bad behavior because you prevent good behavior from happening? Well, blind right. enforcement, and, blind enforcement of the law. Now there's a lot of people, especially on the right who are all for well, that. The law blind enforcement. That's not blind enforcement. That's that is very targeted, very specific enforcement of very particular yeah. laws to achieve a particular end. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree. I agree with Chris on that one. That's exactly. not blind enforcement because uh, you know they are breaking the law now, walking into the the government buildings with their yeah. Guns. But no, no, don't, don't. I think you, that's a protest. I think I think I miss. i maybe I misspoke or 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 maybe yeah. you two. I'm going to say you two misunderstood. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying that that is an uh, an example of blind enforcement. What I was oh. going to say is that blind yeah. enforcement of the law does not help society you have to have a heart within that enforcement um uh you know i can think of many times through my career where someone technically had done something wrong but for me to arrest them for whatever that infraction was would make their life or the life of their family and children significantly worse so let's try and find another solution maybe i can just talk with them and get to the root of the problem i can think for example of mothers who get snatched up for shoplifting now do you Mm. want to arrest that mother when she's shoplifting and she has maybe twenty dollars worth of hamburger meat and she's got four kids at home who are barely making it nutrition wise. Is it right to arrest that mother and put her in jail? Because then you've got to call up child services to find somewhere to place those kids. How about you call child services? You don't arrest that mother. You keep her at home with those kids and you get them involved in some sort of social program to make their situation better. So there, there, that's, right. what, that's, what, that's what I was going to talk about. You know, blind enforcement of the law cancels out uh, those kind of opportunities. Hmm. That's true. There's, there was this place in Louisiana. Uh, there was a group that were going out and they were feeding the homeless. They were cooking huge meals out in the park, like, you know, kind of like a potluck. And then they would bag it up and they would go around and hand it out to these homeless people that haven't been eating. And this was after Katrina, you know. So they were feeding them and the cops were arresting these people for feeding them because they didn't have a proper cooking license and, you know, they didn't have the permits and all that shit. And all they were doing was trying to be nice and well, that's, feed yeah. free people. And that's the kind of stuff that Trisha, yeah. my previous guest, was so upset about. You know, she's from New Orleans and she saw that stuff happen and all throughout, not just New Orleans, but her whole state during uh, Katrina. And that's, you know... That, that blind application of the law. You know, we have zoning laws against cooking in this public place, so don't do it. Yeah, right. Come on. Everybody's starving. Right. We're trying to fix that. 
Fucking sidewalk Susan, man. Sidewalk Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, what's the what's the new one? Karen. They're calling yeah, Karen. Every uh, yeah, yeah, don't Karen, be a, don't yeah. be a Karen. <laughs> don't be a Karen. <laughs> There's way too many Karens in society. Uh, I wonder how many Karens are putting in for a legal name change now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they had this read in on Twitter. They said, uh, it, you know, if you have a name that's most unfortunate, and then one one lady named Karen, she said yes. But then I think there was some other guy. His name was, uh, oh, I think it was Bent Over. I think it was, you know, <laughs> guy Bent Over. Yeah, that, no, that, was, that was unfortunate. Yes, that's a very nice Bent Over. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be named that. Wouldn't but yeah, Karen, I, I go in for a name change. I would. Chris, Chris, we were talking. Oh. A, we were Chris. We were talking a little bit. You and I before we we went uh, live with the episode here uh, about your job. <clears throat> it fascinates me that you. It fascinates me that you travel as much as you, as you do. What is your job title? Uh, my 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 current title is technology futurist. That just sounds so, wicked. Uh, That's that just sounds <laughs> so futuristic. Space <laughs> age. It, it's a fun job, you know, and I mean. It's it's based in in technology, obviously, and and um, and the future, you know. But the more the more that I work with technology, the more that I see that it's not at all about technology. It's about people and how people change and acclimatize to to the new technologies that are there, you know. And so when we talk about tribalism, when we talk about all of these, you know, social currents. Um, you know, technology is not the thing that is driving it. It's facilitating it, you know, and, and, you know, if you go back, if you go back to the seventies, you had Marshall McLuhan, who was a, a, a philosopher, psychologist at university of Toronto. And he predicted this return to tribalism as we had more and more access to media. And he was already seeing this with television and the impact that television was happening on society. Um, and, you know, when you now have the internet and instant availability to, you know, events that are happening a world away, you know, you're, you, you, have these emotional responses to these things you have you know feelings and you know thoughts in your own experience and and how those all kind of tie together you know the world moves faster than humans have changed and so as a result you see this kind of closing off of society and going back into you know the groups of of thought that we we know and and have comfort in as opposed to it necessarily being right how how would you explain that correlation though? Uh, how is it that more technology leads to more tribalism? Because maybe I'm naive or maybe I'm too much of an optimist, but I would think that more technology, uh, especially within the communications branch, would lead to more uh, information of the other, you know, the other society, the other culture, whatever, which would then lead to less tribalism more openness and more and a more inclusive society why why isn't that the case what, what are your thoughts on that if you look at like the earlier days of the internet for example in in the mid late 90s that was very much the case because the technology hadn't advanced as much to it becoming this kind of hybrid communications vehicle it was i put a thing out and people can read it and learn about it and maybe they send me an email so the tempo of the engagement was much yep. lower, right? Okay, yeah. When we when we start to look at these much more dynamic systems like Facebook, like Reddit, like 4chan, that are a have legal protection from an arcane law that was passed in the mid mid late nineties, um, that essentially give these these technology companies the position of being the magazine shop and not the magazine. Right. Okay. And that's the easiest way to explain it. So it's very easy to say, well, easy, quote unquote, to say that, like, this magazine is racist or this magazine is breaking some sort of law. Right. And right. then, you know, you can take legal action against it. You wouldn't take at legal action against the magazine shop because they may, might also be carrying you know, foreign policy weekly or Newsweek yeah. or whatever. They're just there selling the magazine. And so what these laws have done is they've given Facebook and 4chan and all of these other outlets 
that same protection. They're not producing the content. They're just a place where the content lives. Right. You combine that with the weaponization by governments to use those channels to manipulate opinion, um, either through robot farms or, or you know, individuals in, in other countries who are driving, you know, agendas that they are paid to drive. Then you end up in this situation where, you know, people are suddenly going, well, you know what? I, I believe in that. I believe that because that's, you know, something comfortable. You know, it, it, it makes me feel warm and that I understand the world. Um, so it's, it's very much about the acceleration and the tempo than it is necessarily about the technology in and of itself. Because fundamentally, if you look at the definition of technology, it is simply a tool to aid in your day-to-day life yeah you know you know the internet is technically classed the same as your refrigerator or your blender you know (laughs) because it's it's a technology but Mm -hmm. what value i get from my blender or my refrigerator you know is fundamentally different than the value that i get from the the internet or or these these other platforms and tools and i think that you combine that with the, the persistent, relentless defunding of education globally, oh, not, just, not just in the U.S., but, you know, even here in Norway, people are no longer empowered with the critical literacy skills to say, well, is this anti-vaxxer video actually accurate? How do I go and find out if this is accurate? Now, for me, the, the latest one that's been going around, this pandemic video, oh, I, knew, I knew right away that this was not necessarily something I was going to get too married to because the filmmaker didn't know how to spell filmmaker. Oh, no. <laughs> how did he spell it? Yeah. I, saw, I, I didn't see it. that. How do you spell it? <laughs> but I did, I did the whole thing, which is like, I'm going to check that my understanding of the spelling of filmmaker is correct. And I was like, yep, no, he, he got that wrong. <laughs> he <laughs> got that wrong. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's all about the speed, you know? And, and I think one of the nice things that's coming out of this lockdown and you were, you were mentioning it before is things are slowing down. Yeah. You know, yeah. people have time. I think now. that's a good thing. So, I think that is a very good well, here's thing. The problem, though. But people now also have time to sit on the goddamn internet and find information <laughs> and feed their hate. Support their, their feed their hate and feed their own bias. And now they're sitting on 4chan mm. having conspiracy theories with this pandemic bullshit. And, and I actually was surprised at how many of my friends on Facebook shared that garbage. I was like, she. Yeah. She is a conspiracy theorist, and it was like this was like it was clearly gross to me. But well, I tell you, now I have time on the internet, so I, I don't know about the whole <laughs> slow down, and that's so great because now <laughs> and sitting at home and researching all this fucking weird shit. Clarify, we have the opportunity to slow down. How about that? <laughs> okay, let's. I'll, 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 I'll see that. I'll see that. I'll no, see I, that. Yeah, the no. problem is, is that people don't. They, people haven't learned to check their sources. That's yeah. what oh, I know. Me. Me, me as a writer, you know, what I I can't put up an article unless I check my sources and back my sources up. I have to mm-hmm. find proper, you know, articles. I can't just go on to, you know, to the Daily Beast. You know, I, I'm, I'm a Democrat, but the Daily Beast is garbage. You know, that's just uh, <laughs> eccentric bullshit. You have to find the right sources. Check your sources. People don't do that. They haven't been taught that. That needs to be something like, like Chris said, they're defunding school things. Uh, they need to start funding how to check sources when you get information. Make sure the the information that you got is correct. Yeah, the people we used to have that in school. Like we, I remember in my English class and my science class when writing papers, where's your citations? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. List your sources. Yeah, list yeah. your sources. Yeah, they don't do that. No, and now it's not, it's not just listing your sources. Check the source. You can't just, you know, you can't say, well, you know, Alex Jones 2020 said, you know, the cops are going to be, they drink the water. Check, check, you know, to make sure that he knows what to So you get your source and then research that source. Like, yep. you know, do they have problems with lying in the past? Do they have they been accurate all the time? Uh, you know, where did they get their source? And then you also have to follow what I call the, the fourth paragraph rule. 
the when you read an article, usually at the fourth paragraph, they will tell you exactly where they got their source. You know, they'll the, these three paragraphs of just some, ex, you know, just some crazy shit. Uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, whatever they call it, like uh, exciting information. And then at the fourth yeah. paragraph, it says uh, where they actually got the source or who actually yeah. said. It. So always check the fourth paragraph whenever you're reading your article. Pro tips by Tiffany. Pro tips by Tiffany. <laughs> well, you know, it's, thank it's, you for coming to my TED talk. It's important, and I and I think and I think people really literally need an education in sourcing because people yeah. do put a lot of crap out there. I don't care what people say; they can try and blow it off as a conspiracy theory. But our last election was greatly affected by the flow of false, unsourced information. Mm-hmm. And you well, see what you see the result. You see the result of that. Yeah, but it, it's it's worse than that. It it, it was it was the weaponization. Oh, well, there you go. The yeah. yeah, you know it, it's it's one thing to like because I've done this. Like I'll post an article and someone's like, "Yeah, that's shit," and here's why. And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, you got a point there." Yeah. You know, it happens. You know, it happens, and you know, take it back or go like, "Yeah, you know what? You're right." totally spot on but i'm going to leave this here with the warning that like like, hey someone pointed out this is crap don't fall down the trap that i fell down that's fundamentally different from you know a bot farm that's set up in in east ukraine yes ukraine um you know and it's just literally pumping out talking points across a million different accounts to drive a political agenda you know, that's a very, very different thing, you know, and it was funny. I was, um, someone had made me aware of, uh, this debate technique called the Gish Gallup. Oh, and, what is that? Uh, and, it, and essentially what it is, is in a debate, you just sit there spewing out like either misinformation or half truths or whatever. And you essentially inundate your debating partner or your, your sparring partner because they can't address all of the inaccuracies and and so when you look at how we we're consuming information today it's very much like a relentless gish gallop where you're like is you know this, who's a good gish galloper you know who is the hmm? best the best gish galloper i've ever seen kellyanne conway Who? yeah oh that bitch that's that's Miss Goebbels to you. <laughs> <Ms. Gerbil>. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 lady when she gets on certain news channels Beautiful. and she just rolls and rolls and rolls and it is just half truth after half truth, falsehood after falsehood, and it's just I wanna, like I I always want to say with her though I always want to say objective, Your Honor, non-responsive. You know she doesn't give an answer; she gives a twist, and she never answers the question. She and, never. And any half intelligent a lot about person and all that shit. Yeah, and any half intelligent person should be able to see that it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is when you see someone defending an ideology, ideology, a political ideology, or defending a president right. in that fashion. Something should happen in your brain and you should start questioning your allegiances you should start yeah. questioning your political the political path that you're willing to but follow. isn't that the problem of tribalism there you go isn't back to tribalism. Tri- problem of tribal back to tribalism it's like they only look for the the what is it the what is that called chris the biased uh confirmation is that what it's called maybe perhaps yeah, i guess i would Bias confirmation when they they only look for the um the information that uh, it's it confirms their belief. They don't try to look outside and look what the others see. And well, the and search for new, the, not right. yeah, the search for new information stops. They get locked into right. their way of thinking, and that's good enough for them. They just want more proof uh-huh. that they're right. Yeah, right. That's yeah. it. The search for yeah. information and you new know, knowledge stops. But I think it's you know when when we look at you know the the causes of tribalism you know, as we see it manifesting today in the U S you know, for me, something is always caused by something else. Right. And if you have a lot of people who are backing a strong man, it's because there's something missing, you know, and you, you have so many people who are genuinely hurting in the U S sure. You know, and, and you've got people who are overworked, you know, who, who are having to work two, three, four jobs, still not able to pay the bills. You know, and, and okay, well, what's caused that? 
you know, and what's caused all of these other things, you know, and it's it's been this relentless march of the Republican Party since Reagan, yeah. you know, to defund everything in order to get to this moment where now you've got a pliable population who will do whatever you tell them because they are in so much pain that they will comply they will do what you tell them to do because if that relieves just an iota of pain, they will comply. I know? agree. I and agree. I, they've been doing it since before the eighties, to be honest yeah. with you. I agree. The Reagan era was kind of like the the real kickoff to all it was of really it. In the focus. They were like, here's right. how we're gonna get there, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. It's I, I, terrifying that it's been forty years in in the making. Really. Yeah. That's Things a long time. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, <laughs> but like, like, especially with the, the, the constant defunding of the education, if you have a stupid population, I mean, they're mm. going to just follow whatever the leaders. Well, look what they're look what look what they're trying to do with the post office. Mm. I'm pissed off about that, baby, because you know, you know, I, I'm cliffing. You know, I'm cliffing. <laughs> I I was a, a postal carrier. For, tell us, for, tell us what they're. Tell us what this agenda is uh, against the Postal Service and tell me what you feel about it. I feel like, you know, the main goal here is to privatize the post office. That's what the, they've been kind of ragging about for the past 40 years. Back in 2006, uh, they made this law where the post office had to pay for retirement for everybody for 75 years in the future. So, of course... The post office is struggling financially because they had to pay for retirement for people who weren't even fucking born yet. So, uh, you know, they're 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 hurting for money. But the Republicans keep bitching about, OK, now you're broke and you're not making enough money. Well, guess what? The post office wasn't designed to make money. It is a postal service. It's supposed to be a service, a social service. <laughs> Everybody should be served no matter where you live. But if you privatize it, now all of a sudden it's not beneficial financially to drive down that long dirt road to go deliver to those two houses. So now those people have to come all the way into fucking town. Now, what if grandma that lives down there in that farm way out there, she can't get down there. Now she can't get her medication. Now she can't vote. And it's kind of, it's a way to... Uh, they want people to not vote by mail. And the reason why is, first of all, us, us Americans that live, all expats that live outside the U.S., we've seen the world. I think we're a little bit more, when you see different cultures and you see different uh, people and the different lives and you can, you start to have a little bit of empathy. And when well, you get a little bit of empathy, you just kind of stop voting Republican. Because you gotta, you gotta kind of, you gotta push that empathy down if you're gonna be a Republican. <laughs> yeah. You gotta yeah. mash that shit down because you gotta have what you want when you want when you want it. But I think that's what the whole point of privatization is to disenfranchise millions of voters. People who live overseas, people who live in the rural areas, people who live in poor areas. I mean, when you privatize it, that's what it is. It's going to be all about the money and all about but, no, no longer a service. But just to play the devil's advocate again, um, I'm feeling devilish with my red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you when 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 you think about how uh, people will, it, it, it can make it more difficult for people to vote by privatizing the the, the mail service. Uh, and then mm -hmm. you mentioned poor people, rural people, but isn't that the foundation of the Republican Party, these flyover states, these rural... This, that's the whole thing, though. That's the cut off your nose to spite your face, right? So uh, these people that live in the rural areas, there's only so many. Like, you know, whatever you show the map, of, yeah. uh, you know, when they show the blues and the red on the map... The number of delegates, all, yeah. Number of delegates, and then they show all this, uh, you know, land in South Dakota, as quote-unquote, that voted for, for Trump or whatever, voted Republican... That's landmass. So there's only a few votes really that they'll lose. And so they're, but they know that they're going to lose all the expats that are out in the world. I see. Who most of us, I mean, there are, I mean, I'm not going to lie, there are some Republicans out here that still gun toting and woo woo. Sure, sure. But, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but there's not many of us. I mean, I've, you know, it, when, you, when you are willing to explore the world and willing to live in another country with all these goddamn people that don't speak English, then obviously. <laughs> The most of us are going to be Democratic, or at least not Republican, or at least certainly not Trumpists. You're certainly not racist. 
can't you can't live in Bangkok and be a racist and be okay with life over there. Right. You immediately go back to your Louisiana town or whatever the fuck you got going on there. Brunswick, so yeah, and then only that, then you have people in in uh, major cities who will be cut off as well because uh, it might not be beneficial to the post office to go there uh, for any reason. Like oh, like let's say city blocks. The mailman has to walk up several stairs to deliver, you know, in some city blocks. I, I know where I lived. I lived in, uh, or I delivered in both the projects in my town and then also in the the rural areas. And then I remember going to the apartment complexes. I had to fucking climb upstairs to deliver a package. But I did it because it was my goddamn job. But if it takes time to do that and you have to pay the mail carrier per hour, to go upstairs, they're going to be like, nope, you can just give them a ticket, have them come to the post office, pick them up. But what if they don't have a car? What if they're poor and they don't have a car? Poor black folk, they tend tend to vote Democratic because, you know, they get the services, the social services that they need. And they don't want black folk voting. Let's be real. Yeah. You know, to me, it's and so. There's also, yeah, go ahead. Go Chris. Ahead. No, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say one other one other part that you're overlooking, though, and this kind of goes back to the three or four jobs point, which is that when you allow for vote by mail, you give people the time, simply just the time to participate because we don't we don't have a holiday for it. We don't give people time off to go vote. If you suddenly allow if you facilitate voting through mail in ballot. Then the working you people vote. Allow, yeah. You allow people the time to participate. We don't want that. And let, let me expand. <laughs> let, let me expand on that also, Chris, because you made an excellent point there. Now you allow people time to participate, but you also allow people time to actually research the candidates. I know that mm-hmm. I get when good I, point ballot. I, I don't have to send it in right there. I don't have to make the decision, a split second fucking decision right there and just vote red down the line or vote, vote blue down the line. When I get my mail-in ballots, I'm like, great, I have it. I got a, a week to turn it in. I get there and I get on the internet and I research. What, is, what does this guy stand for? What does this sheriff, I mean, even the small, the down ballot guys, you know? Uh, what does this lawyer do? You know, what is this judge thinking? You know, what is this uh, the sheriff? What is this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, you know, mm-hmm. act or whatever yeah. they want to propose. What does this mean for me? And what does that mean for my people? So I have time to get on and actually research the thing. They don't want people to be educated when they vote. They want mm-hmm. people to have the vote. People, like Chris said, they work in three, four, five jobs. They can't get down to the voting center that day because they have to feed their goddamn kids. They can't vote that day. Mm-hmm. That's garbage. Why can't they make voting day a national holiday? You know, I, I just get, I get, I get tired. I get weary of, of hearing these, these ultra patriots, uh, self-proclaimed patriots, uh, preaching <laughs> about America, this America, that, uh, and democracy is the best way. How democratic is it when you actively suppress the vote? Why won't they address that? Well, back to the tribalism doesn't fit their Back tribe to doesn't fit their tribe to admit that that's what's going on exactly i agree I, and i think i think the postal i mean the postal service is not just so important for people to vote but i mean they are they are fucking up vets you know the vets get their you know diabetic insulin you know medication through the mail i when i you know i got my medication through the mail uh, it, it's just it's it's frustrating that they're hurting so many people by privatizing this and it's also extremely frustrating that nobody's taking this seriously or at least it feels like nobody's taking it seriously I had somebody comment when I posted it yesterday about that they um, they chose a Republican donor businessman who have any postal experience. Now he's the postmaster fucking general. What is this and, thing? Yeah. Uh, what is this thing in the government where he is placing people in these key positions that have zero experience? Zero experience. And even the, the EPA guy, what was his name? I can't remember, but they put him in charge of the EPA when he like actively tried to dismantle it before. Mm. An old girl in the educational department. What's her name? Betsy oh, Ross. The boss. That, <laughs> Betsy the boss. Don't, the Betsy Ross is the girl that made the flag. I know. I'm Betsy just the boss. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That 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 heifer. Let's talk about that heifer. She is defunding so much of. Uh, well, she of was openly. Ed- she was openly against um, uh, funding. Uh, for public schools, openly against that before she got that position. It's almost as if. It's almost as if our so-called president sees someone who wants to tear things down so that the most amount of people are hurt and he'll put them in that position. 
It's almost like yeah. he is willfully trying to hurt people. Oh yeah. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not wrong. But my question is, but my question is to what end? What what is the purpose of this? Well, in the case of Davos, I mean, that was easily uh, Davos. You know, that's Davos. Yeah, yeah Davos whatever. is the place where all the rich people go to make these decisions. <laughs> um, yeah, but in her case, it's you know to drive the agenda of privatization, where she has a huge financial stake. It's just about, it, it's all about putting money in your pocket. Yeah, you can trace you know? the line it's of like, corruption. Okay, you've got money in private schools. I'm going to put you in charge of, of schools so that we can drive funding there. Oh, you're in charge of, you know, healthcare, and you just happen to be a pharmaceutical CEO. Okay. Okay, <laughs> that, that makes complete Ooh. sense, right? I see those no, things. It me off. I see those things and it hurts me to my core. I, I don't want my country to be like that. I don't, no. uh, it hurts. It hurts to see it. It really does. Now, that's not to say I feel ashamed. Some people, well, aren't you ashamed to be an American? Right? No, no, I'm not. Because no. no. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't vote that son of a gun in, into office. I didn't do it. So no. I have nothing to feel ashamed for. I know no. what our country should stand for. It just hurts me to see that our country is not standing for those things. But the important thing is that you rise up against it. You be loud as fuck. You you write to every congressman you got. I know I do it. I blow up the phone over at that DeSantis motherfucker in my Florida, Florida state. I blow his phone up. You call your, even if you don't live, uh, currently live there. I'm a Floridian. I'm still, I got my driver's license. So technically I'm a legal Floridian. So I, I go to the local. I go for, for my county. I'll call them up about small county things, but I will blow up DeSantis' phone. Uh, just be loud. Be loud. Be a loud, proud American because that's what we were in the beginning. We were dissenters in the fucking beginning. That's how we became America. Yes. So I think it's time for us to rise up and be proper Americans and dissent against this fool. Tiffany, are you unwelcome back in Florida? <laughs> Do they have a posse? Do they have a posse waiting for you if you cross the state line? <laughs> you know they might, but uh, look, the great thing about Florida, Florida is like Florida is a mixed bag. Florida, yes, Florida it is, is kind it of is. It's, it's a wonderful state in the sense that first of all, of course, we got Florida man. Hey, uh, hi, hi, baby, <laughs> I miss Florida man. But uh, we, we are a mixed bag down there because the further south you go, the more Democrat. Down in Miami, you know, we're all about sharing things, and even in Orlando. Uh, that, but up north, you know, in the Panhandle, we got the gun-toting Bush, you know, Trump-loving you know, hillbillies or whatever, but I come from central Florida where, where, where I go home and that's kind of where the two shores meet. So we have the rednecks driving their trucks, but then we also have, you know, the Jamaicans chilling and puffing their weed out in the street or whatever. So we got a, it's, it's a great mixed bag in Florida. And what's the, yeah, difference, definitely- what's the difference between a redneck and a hillbilly? Is it geographical? <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 because we don't have any hills in Florida. We don't have any yeah. hills, yeah. It might be one of those Chevy versus Ford things. Yeah, it's just a brand <laughs> affinity. affinity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. S- Sanka versus Nespresso, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, it's uh, Jim, Jim Beam versus Jack Daniels kind of thing. You know? Yeah, it's, it's the same but different. It's the same, but different. You know, if I if I can go back a, a little bit, I had asked you, Chris, about your job, and then we got started talking about technology and how it's affected tribalism and and affected our society. But what exactly is a technology futures? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, it's. I, I split my time in my role. So my my current company has a very large research and development function. And so I work with them looking at the the trends that they're identifying, um, look at the, the variety of different research projects that they're involved in. My company works in everything from future medicine to energy transition, um, you know, and then how do we go about uh, developing products and services to bring that, that research to market? And, okay. you know, and I'm, I'm very lucky in that role because we, we, pride ourselves in our third party position being very neutral 
Um, but I contest that because I'm like, the moment someone pays you for something, you're not neutral. But anyway, that's, um, that's a whole other philosophical discussion. Yeah. But, uh, but fundamentally, you know, we're not publicly traded. Um, so we don't have shareholders coming in and saying, well, we see you're devaluing oil as an energy source. You should really not do that. It's like, no, we, we come with the research we come with. And if people don't like that, well, okay. such is life. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, you know, in the last year, I've spent a lot of time researching about quantum computing and, and how that will transform society. And, you know, I've been working a bit with our energy transition team, um, looking at the, the 50 year, you know, move move away from from fossil fuels and how that will change societies yeah. so it's a it's an interesting job you know a lot of smarter people than me in the room that's for sure <laughs> well you know you say that you say that and you laugh it off but you seem to be an extremely intelligent guy you know I, i've just been kind of sitting back and, and letting you guys do most of the talking but chris when you were talking about technology and how it affects society that was a very educated rant if we can call that a rant i mean you you <laughs> You weren't just babbling. You've you've got you you have a thought process that tells at least me. Oh, he knows his shit. That, he oh knows yeah, his yeah, shit. Abs- absolutely. Yeah. And <laughs> if, if just like just like people who practice stand up routines, I do a new one every six months. <laughs> 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 wait, wait for my next special kind of thing. You know, it's a. No, it's, but it's like any it's, it's any discipline, right? If if you're in it every day and you're really engaged in it and you're really doing yeah. it, you realize eventually you have to find other ways to to describe it for people who aren't working in it every day, yeah. you know, and, and really make it something that they understand why this impacts their life, why it's why it really matters to them, you know. And I mean, you know, I can go on and on about the nuances of Netflix's technology architecture and, and why it's so brilliant and their business models, but it doesn't explain, you know, the the positive and the negative societal impact yes. of having architectures like that. You know, and that's really what people care about is like, well, why does the way Netflix do things you know potentially have a negative impact on me so when you 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 have a degree in in what's uh philosophy Philosophy. right and i hear that i hear that that. i can hear that in the way you speak chris and i think you do Mm -hmm. it in a good way it's it some people are so cerebral uh in their speech patterns that it makes it hard for the average joe to follow but you speak in such a clear and fluid way about high level subjects um that is a talent that's a talent like i I said i have a whole team of researchers (laughs) 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 who are who are doing the heavy lifting and then i just come to the table (laughs) We talk it out. Yeah. <laughs> How did you? What was he makes, the, it, he makes it understandable in bite sized pieces, I think. Because I know I've been out and had a couple beers with Chris, and we, we have like, you know, deep talks about hard subjects. In, and, <laughs> but he, he breaks it down because I have no philosophy background. You know, I have, you know, none of that. I have a nursing degree and I'm working on like a data and the lakes degree. <laughs> but he can break it down in the pieces that's bite sized and good to understand. And I think I said, I think he needs to be on your show a little more often, John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I snatched him up now while he's sitting at home and not travel, <laughs> not traveling around the world constantly. <laughs> right. But how did you? How did you get? The, how did, lockdown now. <laughs> now this this company that you work for is it a Norwegian company or is it an American company? But you're just yeah. based here. It's a Norwegian company, but it. It's got offices all over the place. So, so you applied for so that sometimes job. Sometimes they send me to Poland, and no, they found me. Ah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. So, mm. look at him. Be, look at him sitting there trying to be all humble. I'm, I'm in demand. This <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Did I start this podcast off wrong? Joking about? Oh yeah. You know what? By the way, <laughs> by no. By the way, to put some honor on the on that whole situation, uh, the man who was murdered in Brunswick, Georgia. His name is Ahmad Arbery. I looked his name up while we were talking. Okay, good. I'm Ahmad glad you Arbery. did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, his his name needs to be shouted loud, loud. 
Well, um, I want to see hashtags. Yeah. I want to see it spread around. I want to see, like I said, people are already uh, sending around the telephone number to the uh, district attorney in, in uh, right. the Brunswick area. So, so people are right. getting active. But here, let, let me ask you then, Chris, how can we use technology to help get justice, justice for him? How can we use that spread uh, knowledge about him? How can we use it to force the hand of the government to do something about this? So uh, I'm going to say something very hypocritical here because I'm the mm -hmm. worst on Facebook, just shit posting loads of stuff <laughs> and I yeah. don't like <laughs> at all. Um, I'm the worst yeah. at this, but I think that, you know, when there's, there's two sides to that conversation. One is obviously reaching out to the, the, the district attorney, to, to the lawmakers and say, like, we do not find this acceptable. That's, that's one piece. But the other piece is, is that community education, you know, and, and this is, this is where I'm going to be a bit hypocritical here is that it, you know, I'm, I'm white male from new England, you know, it's like, I am the, the, I am the problem embodied here, you know, and and so when when I'm talking to people about this, it's about communicating to them why I, in my position of privilege, see this as a fundamental uh, threat to our society, you know, and, and, you know, it's about putting that very personal side on it. So it's very difficult to say that this is a, a technology thing. It's about I, I can use technology to talk to people over much greater geographies than I could before. But it's, it is very much about taking the time to reflect as, as yourself and to right. be able to really put that, that personal side to it, because that's, that's going to convince, that's going to be the thing that convinces the other person to then call the district attorney or to call their lawmaker and say, Hey, right. it's not happening in our state yet, but, this is something that I see as a potential problem in the future for us. And right. we should get ahead of the curve on that. We should make it so that we don't ever have right. bad press around the world because we've allowed this to happen. But there's so you know? many people, there's so many people who are reluctant to even talk about these kind of issues well, though. John, let me, let me tell you why though. I, I want to, I want to ask you this question. How do you feel as a black man, uh, that a white person stands up and talks about black issues because I've tried to do that on social media and I've actually been slapped down by black folk. You're a cracker. You don't have any, you don't have any say in this, even though, I'm, even though I'm a quote unquote on your side, I'm like, this is atrocious. This is awful. I cannot believe this is happening. And then there, there are some black folk that don't like white folk uh, talking about black issues. What, 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 how do you feel about it? Well, <clears throat> I have no problem. <clears throat> with a white man or a white woman who is an ally and who stands up and speaks out. I believe that that is what it's going to take in order to make any significant change because nobody's right. been listening to black people since, you know, since 18, right. you know, 1865. Before that, when, well, well, I'm, before thinking, that. I'm thinking 1865 when things were supposed to change, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so, and then of course, before that, so nobody's yeah. listening to us. So I think that the incorporation of non-black allies who have a larger platform, who have more influence, more financial backing, is that's what it's going to take. You know, just pic picture this. If you're sitting at a bar or you're sitting at a party and somebody starts talking, uh, you know, just starts talking mess about black people. It is one thing to hear that and then comment how horrible it was afterwards. It's something totally different if a white person speaks up and says, hey, stop that. That's Shut wrong up. because right. that will, there, there is a different effect to that. So right. I, would, I would like to see more white people do what you do. Stand up, speak yeah. out, tell people what's wrong. Yeah. And, and I think that, that really points to what it is to be an ally as opposed to just saying like, you know, taking up the, the black mantle, being an ally is saying us white folk need to change our behavior. Exactly. Yeah. I do not find your behavior, fellow white folk to be acceptable. Yeah. And here's why, because here's the negative, here's the negative thing it does to us. Here's what it does to us 
yeah. as as our community. And here's what it does to them. It's you know, yeah. it, it's we we hurt ourselves as a collective civilization. But I think it, to be that that proper ally, because I've been speaking a lot with the um, Latina community here in, in Oslo, um, you know, with the, Can you say the Latina Chilean again? Protest. Latina. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't pronounce that correctly. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it, it's that. It's not about taking up someone else's mantle necessarily. Sometimes you do that, like if there's street protests or, or you're trying to explain why a particular issue is important. But it is very much about taking that community ownership and saying, like, knock it off. Yeah, this yeah. is not okay. Not you know, off. hurting them hurts us. Well, I think that's very powerful. You know, if and, more people and, did and that, that, yeah, you know, because it's I'm never going to understand the African American experience. I'm never going to understand the Latina experience. I'm never going to understand any of those experiences. I know what it is to be a white man. I grew up around a lot of racists. Uh, I know, and, and this this goes back to the point I was making earlier: is who hurt you, such that you yes. think this is okay? Yes, 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 yes. What, what's Reach causing that. you that pain that makes you think that this behavior is acceptable? And if yeah. if you can tell me what that pain is, I will figure out a way to try and help you in your pain, so you knock it off. Yeah, you know, I, but, I've I've said this before. I don't believe. Uh, you, you could be a, a robe-wearing, cross-burning Klansman, but I don't think that they truly, truly believe in their own rhetoric. I believe that that rhetoric, that that racist attitude and those racist beliefs, I believe that that is a band-aid on some kind of sore that they have. They know they look like an idiot. They know they sound stupid, but they're trying to do something to elevate themselves out of something that they're bothered by about their it's, own personality well, like, or about their own. It's just like any other bully in the world. You know, it bullies become bullies in the schoolyard because they're bullied at home. Yeah. You know, they, they, they need, because they've been pushed down so hard by something, by their parent or by their big brother who knocks them down that in order to feel to take back their power, so to speak, they have to knock somebody else down to feel more elevated than somebody else. So like Chris says, you know, what, what the fuck is your pain? What, what is your problem? Let's get down to your issue because you got to know, you yeah. have to know as a human being that doing that to somebody else they isn't know. okay. They know. I mean, they especially, know. Especially, especially, especially the ones that are so Christian, you know, oh, like, yeah. what the fuck yeah. do you do? Jesus didn't hit black folk. I, I don't know. Jesus didn't know. Well, let's take it back. Let's take it back to the days of slavery in America. This always fascinated me. Um, <clears throat> there were white slave owners that obviously felt what they felt about black people because they enslaved them, treated them horrible, killed them when they wanted. They had, you know, what you know what they did with slaves, and yet that same slave master would lay down with one of his black slave women. Word. I never. I, there's so many black folk. There's so many black folk with the last name Washington. I just like wondered where that came from. Well, I, just, I have I, a I joke. Ask you. I have a bit. I have a bit. Uh, I have a bit in my stand-up routine. Uh, it kind of leads into me, uh, you know, jokingly blaming Norwegians for their participation in the slave trade. And, you know, and then I have, I have an artful pause and I let people react and some of them, no, no, yeah. you know, and the looks on their face. And I say, Hey, wait a minute, because I went to college with this black brother and his name was Tyrone Severinsen. So you can't tell me, you know, where did he get that? Where did he get that name from? So, <laughs> so, no, but, the, yeah. but that is a phenomenon that always fascinated me that you, you think what you think about your black slaves and how useless and animalistic they are. And yet you'll lay down and have sex with a black woman who you have enslaved. I don't, yeah. I don't understand how that's possible. If you truly believe, if you truly believe that rhetoric that you're spouting out, how could you bring yourself to have sex with one of them? Well, yeah. let's just say, well, hold on that. But let's with the whole sex thing. Sex is not always about love, honey. Mostly it's about power. Like that's what rape is about. Rape is not about. So you say Snoop feels, Snoop feels powerful when she forces me. 
Oh um, yeah, girl. Okay. Oh, that explains. Right. Listen, you a big man. She, <laughs> you she, she she held on to you for eight seconds and woo! eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, now you hurt my feelings. Yeah. Eight seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you, her. That's what you do. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're good. That's like bull riding. <laughs> so there's Florida coming out. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's sometimes, sometimes that's about power. And I think that's also about back then with the slavery. It wasn't like, I don't know if any of them fell in love with them black ladies. Well, but I let's think break it, it down. But let's break it down. If they truly felt that, you know, the, what did they say? Black, that their black slaves had no soul, that their black slaves were no better than an animal. Now let's look at that right. animal thing. They thought of it as a thing. If I, if, <laughs> if I, it, your, your fleshlight doesn't have a soul either, but you'll fucking, if, uh, if you'll, that's if that's you don't know my flashlight. Yeah, but listen. <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, but listen. If they, if they, but if they, if they put, if they put these slaves on the same level or lower level than an animal, then mm-hmm. that means that there's a lot of slave owners out there who committed bestiality. Because yes, they considered sir. their yes. slaves an animal, and it did. You there's know? videos all over the internet. Yes, so. Yes. There's a reason there are laws on the book. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, but but to me, but to me, if you break it down like that, it shows yeah. that a lot of people who have these racist uh, ideas and follow a racist ideology, they truly don't believe it. It is masking something. It's definitely masking something. It's uh, but I, you know what? I don't know because if you how's that for, really, how's that for philosophy there, Chris? Do I, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. But if you're raised that way from 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 birth to be taught that these are people and these are things, you know, like white people are people. If you're raised to believe that that's a world you don't know any better, which there are still people that are born into racism and it's indoctrinated into you. I mean, I mean, I, no, no hate on, you know, religious folk. But, you know, they're indoctrinated into believing that this invisible man in the sky, whether it be Allah, whether it be God or whatever, you know, he, he wants to judge you when he sees you when you masturbate. But somehow he was blinded to 400 years of slavery and he wasn't there because they're indoctrinated into it. So if they're indoctrinated into racism, they might possibly believe it, honey. I, 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 I'm glad you have the optimism of saying they don't believe the rhetoric, but I <laughs> Some I believe that some people are born into it, and, and it's an indoctrination, just like any other cult, any other religion, any other belief system. You're born into it. You're taught it since you're a child. That's the only thing you know. That's what life is. So it's all about. I don't but, know. But I, I don't know. I, I I just believe that every so-called hardcore racist has at least one moment in their adult life where they think, ah, eh, you know. I, I this isn't that. matching up. This is I'm this rhetoric isn't matching up with the reality. I get. I. I, I, cha- I, I challenge. I challenge any <laughs> anybody who holds those ideas, whether it's uh, some of these groups here in Norway, or, or if you're a racist back from the states, come on this podcast and let's talk about it. And I guarantee but, you. Yeah. I guarantee you. Yeah. There's a hole. There's a and, hole and, in that. And, and we won't. We won't attack you. Let's just say that. Let's let's be open to anybody that holds these ideologies to come on your show, and tell us about their ideas. Without we won't attack you. I would. I want to understand their mind. Yeah. And where come from and why they think what they think uh i'd be willing to listen to that show hardcore and hear what they have to say uh because i'm interested in how that that mindset came from where well, it came yeah. from and what it's about well i like to have a lot yeah. of different people on my podcast uh yeah uh, some of them are people i truly enjoy and love you know like you two some of them are people that i'm inspired by some of them are people that have you know i had a guy who um a few episodes ago, who's a presidential candidate. And I agreed with almost nothing that that gentleman had to say. Uh, but it's certain, but it's certainly interesting to hear uh, what he had to say. So if you are, yeah. if you're a racist, uh, get in touch with me, uh, get my attention. Don't burn a cross in my yard. Get my attention. somehow. <laughs> get my attention. Yeah, somehow. Use the medium of telephone, not, not cross burning. Thank That's you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think what you're pointing to is kind of a, a bigger challenge of just existence without getting too philosophical. And, and that's, you know, the, the calcification of thinking. Yes. You know, is yes. that, you know, the, if, if you are not regularly challenged on what you believe, 
then you tend to calcify, you know? And, And I mean, I'll be the first to admit, you know, I grew up quite conservative, you know, very, you know, you know, New Hampshire is, you know, it's live free or die, you know? And, and, uh, you know, to, to exercise that kind of, you know, critical analysis, not just of the media that you're consuming or all of the other stuff we had discussed. Um, and maybe this is a good way to put a pin in it, but, um, you know, but it's also that, that critical self analysis, you know, yeah. is what I believe now still valid, you know, because this is something I believed in 20 years ago. Thank does you. it still hold water? Thank you know, you. like, and that's why I said, you know, it, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, you know, it's, it, it's that constant process of, of evaluation and reevaluation of yeah. what you know to be true, you know, and, it, and yeah. you know, we expect this of scientists, you know, to constantly be testing and retesting and retesting. It's like we should be doing that with our own ideologies and belief systems as well. I agree. Absolutely. Because scientists are always trying to prove themselves wrong. Mm. And I think that we should constantly look at our beliefs and try to prove it wrong. And if it still holds water, if you've researched it and and like really tried to find the opposite view and see, does it still hold water? Then it should be a belief. But I think, uh, you know, your beliefs should be like underwear. It should be changed often. And if it's full of shit, wait, 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 underwear should be changed <laughs> off in your underwear, Tiffany. Are we going back to the bestiality conversation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm getting up in age, so sometimes I should. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it re- you know, your beliefs are just like underwear. It should be, it should be checked and changed off it to be, you know, I truly believe is it that. full of shit? Is it full of shit? Then dump it and get a new pair. I truly <laughs> believe that. I'm trying to grow consistently, mm-hmm. uh, uh, constantly, constant growth, constant self-improvement, which then puts mm-hmm. me in a position to be able to help others more effectively. That's mm-hmm. the way I try to live my life. I think that everyone to a certain degree lives their life that way to a certain degree. Even that white robed white, hat wearing clansmen i believe they have a moment or two or more in their life where they question their own rhetoric that, yeah, i think that's yeah. i think that's a na- i think that's natural i think that's a natural state for a human i mean now i'm trying to get philosoph- philosophical without an, edu- <laughs> without an education but i think it is a natural i think it's a natural thing for humanity to have at least a certain degree of introspection and to have a desire to analyze one's beliefs i think yeah. everyone does that at some point i i <laughs> Everybody does that at some point, but I can't. So that's why I can't. Say. That's why I can't believe that a so-called hardcore racist truly believes that, unquestioned. Mm-hmm. Well, introspection, you know, comes from doubt, right? Yeah, it all starts with doubt. But don't you think? And, okay, yeah. But don't you think then that a racist, and they're out there, a racist who can't stand black people, but they love LeBron James. Don't you think that they will at some point? Say, hey, wait a minute. I thought I didn't like anything to, that had to do with black people, but they're a fan of LeBron James. Or they like but Michael this, Jackson or Prince's music. But this goes to what Tiffany was saying earlier. This, this goes back to what Tiffany was saying earlier. And also, it, to put a bit of a finer point on it, let, let us not I- ignore the fact that slavery was fundamentally an economic yeah. mechanism as well. Mm-hmm. So you can be a racist and be totally cool with LeBron James, Michael Jackson, Prince, all of that, because that, that's a financial transaction. I'm paying you to dance for me. I yeah. see. I see. You know? Dance, monkey. And dance. I see. That's I see. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. See. You know, and, and, and so, so that, that's where you get that disconnect, you know, where you, I remember this in the eighties, like I knew really racist people, but they loved Eddie Murphy. And I was like, how do you reconcile yeah. that? <laughs> I had a guy, I had a guy told me, tell me we were in the, the little town uh, next to ours at a uh, sw- uh, outdoor swimming pool. And we were talking to some kids from that town. And this one kid said um, something to the effect that I need to shut up. I need to be quiet. And I shouldn't think that black people are worth anything because before Michael Jackson, uh, black people were meaningless. And this was like in 1982, 83 when Michael Jackson was, was, was really breaking out. So, and a kid actually, kid actually told me that. So yeah, that goes into, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. it's just, a, yeah. 
I, I, I don't want to. You can go. Even further. You can go a step further back and and look at the amount of shit that Louis Armstrong got. You oh, know, yeah. if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, you know, it's like Louis Armstrong was was. You know, he was seen as a sellout by the African American community, but Whitney at the Houston same time, too. Mm-hmm. Whitney Houston was too. Yeah, I remember you know, when and Houston it, it, became popular. Yeah, you know, and, and was, uh, the black community yeah. hater because she sang white music or whatever to become popular. Mm. You know, then she got the hate from both sides. That was yeah. that was crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and so it's you know. It, mm-hmm. It, it always goes back to, to, unfortunately, it goes back to that being a substantial element of, you know, that access of the African-American community to, you know, acceptance, you know, is like, what, what, what's going to be the return on my investment in you? Exactly. Are you going to make me money? Like what you, I, I think what you were, the point you were make, trying to make about Louis Armstrong was that people loved his music and he would play in these big clubs, but they would make him walk in through the back door. He wouldn't be allowed to socialize afterwards. Right. He had to eat his meal outside in the alley. But they, yeah. but they certainly, mm-hmm. but they certainly paid. They, they certainly in, enjoyed his music. Who who was that mm-hmm. black actress that was in Gone with the Wind? They did the same thing with her, didn't they? Yes. I can't remember what name was. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm uh, blanking. Hattie May. Um, um, yes, uh, something. Yeah. They, they did the same with her. I mean, they they she was a, a a dynamic star in that movie, but she had to come in through the back door. She had to sit over in a different corner. They treated her like garbage, yep. really, and it's heartbreaking. So, like Chris says, you know, it's it wasn't that they were suddenly – being celebrated and represented, it was basically the the monkey declaring the symbols for you. Yeah, and, hey, exactly. They, yeah. they didn't. They didn't. It, so mm-hmm. yeah, I, I don't see any kind of uh, non racist thing in that. So even though they are represented in this yeah. uh, celebrity atmosphere, no. Yeah. No. The the book that really opened my eyes to all of that dynamic and i was lucky to have read it when i read it when i was in high school was ralph ellison's invisible man you know i i I just that's so interesting just yesterday i started reading that uh here i am i'm 51 years old and i'm just now for the first time reading that book i just started it yesterday yeah yeah it's an incredible book absolutely amazing book you know but it, it was definitely one of those you know moments of doubt for me, where it was like, okay, we're going to learn this. H- gonna, Hattie McDaniel. You know, Hattie McDaniel is her name. Hattie thank McDaniel. You. Yeah. Name. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank Sorry, you. go ahead, Chris. No, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> you know it, it was that, you know, moment of doubt and, right. you know, being met. And this was the, the point that I was attempting to get to, but went off into space with it, is that, you know, it's, you never know when someone's going to have that moment of doubt where they're uh, where they are then going to be open for that reflection and beginning that process. Right. And so this is why if all you ever do is confront in a conflict way, yeah. you're never going to, that door is never going to be open to you because all you're ever doing is bringing conflict to the table. It's not to say that there aren't moments when you should, yeah. you know, you know, you know, get in there and punch a fascist, you know, like I'm all for yeah. that. I'm here for that. But yeah. You know, if it, you know, you, you know, it's that old saying, you know, you get, you get more ants with honey than vinegar, you know, and, yeah. and if you're there, if you're there to meet them in that moment of uncertainty and be constructive in that conversation, it's not to say you're going to convert them overnight, but it starts that yeah. process. Yes. You know, and I, I agree. You know, John, yeah, John, we talked about that man, David Weissman. I don't know if you've got him on your show or not, but that was exactly what happened to him. He was a Trump supporter and he was like full out on Twitter. And then Sarah Silverman engaged him in a moment of doubt. Oh, is that uh, how it started? Was, okay. Sarah that's Silverman. how it started. And that's how he converted from Trumpism to uh, s- opening his eyes was that Sarah Silverman didn't come combative at him. Mm. She even asked him questions. Why do you think that? Why do you believe that? And well, here's the other side of it. And they, they actually had a conversation. And then in that moment of <sighs> doubt, showed him another side of maybe what you believe is not a hundred percent 
solidified and concrete. Maybe, maybe there's a shade of gray here that you might need to look at. And he did. And now he is way on the opposite side of he speaks out against Trump all the time. He even admits he's ashamed yeah. that he voted. For Trump. So Chris has a good point about the way you interact with somebody in that moment of doubt. Don't come combative. Come with a, a listening ear. Ask the other person, what do you believe and why do you believe that? Yeah. And maybe come with like some counter information that, you know, yep. maybe there's a shade of to that, or maybe there's another side to that, you know. I'd rather uh, listen. Very- I'd rather listen, try and understand, and then discuss. But yes, yeah. some, you know, some people, they just go right to the name, calling and finger pointing. And, right. that's, and that's so not very productive. Sometimes you just got to punch a fascist. Sometimes you just got to <laughs> And you know, I, I'm down with that too, Chris. And you know, and you know, <laughs> Tiffany, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned David Weissman. I've actually forgotten about that. You did tell me I should get in touch Don't with him. Don't forget. I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to contact him today. That story, his story is amazing. His story yeah. of transformation from being I'd like to the, hear it angry trumpist to flipping over like way over the other side opening his eyes and saying that wow i can't believe that was me you know just four years ago and look how far i've come and yeah. i have a different sense of empathy for other people yeah. and like I said, you saw the picture of him the before and after you know of him being a trump supporter and and then all of a sudden being free from the chain so it's, it's yeah. kind of like a cult a cult member escaping the cult. Well, I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear that story. I can't believe I forgot about that, Uh, but yes. You uh, gotta call that dude. I'm going to do that. I'm going to call him today. You know what I'd like to do? do? You know what I'd like to do for the last uh, few minutes here, uh, 10, 15 minutes, however long it takes is shift, shift over to talk about art. Um, you hate it. (laughs) (laughs) we have i have this uh this uh feature on my website this page on my website called loyal oak artists and uh there's actually a few more people that are lined up to get involved in that but the first i hope so the first one i want to profile is you your your artwork is already on there some of your artwork is already on there tiffany and the whole idea behind Loyal Oak Artists is, you know, if you if you picture an oak tree, uh, it's old and it's it's big. It's got all kinds of branches, and each branch leads back to the roots of that tree. So each Loyal Oak Artist is a branch on my oak tree, and then the word loyal is simply what it is. You know, mutual support, uh, mutual advocacy. Uh, so I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get this thing off the ground so that it's something where musicians, artists, you could be a graphic designer, uh, anybody who does anything within the arts or anything that can be interpreted as being within the arts. I'm trying to get people photographers. Involved. Photographers. I mean, let's not forget the photographers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to make it a meet meeting place, uh, a digital meeting place where people can advertise their wares. And uh, and not just and not just advertise, but actually, I think it would be great to collaborate. Well, exactly, I mean, to have, exactly. Yeah, to have the photographer that's good at that, you know, it just become a community there where the photographer can take, you know, the pictures of the art, and yeah. uh, the graphic artist can help uh, advertise for, you know, the artists, and and everybody can work together to to uh, show their art. But I think we need to also not look away from stand up comedians. I mean, that's an art. Absolutely. Uh, Get your stand-up comedian guys on there so we can work together and see how we can collaborate to lift each other up. Because starving artists is a it's a it's a real fucking thing, That's my a friend. Thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> it is. I you know Broke I've been industry. an artist since I was twenty two, and and you know I I sell a piece here, I sell a piece there. It's a you know, but it's not a career, you know. So, uh, but if if people and I don't even want to make it a career because if I make it a career, then it's a job, then it's not fun to do anymore. Yeah, but hold on. I mean, I can I take a little bit of contention with that there. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but it, 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 why does it have to be classified as a job? Why can't it just be what it is? It's you doing something that you enjoy, but you're able right. to make, but you're able to support yourself from it. Because I think you're. F- uh, I think it can. I think that can happen. I, I'm trying. It I want to. It, it can happen. But here's the thing: is that, that for you? you it know, can happen for you. I know yeah. it can. Well, here's the thing is with me, with my creative process, the way I, the way I work creatively, if it's now suddenly demanded of me, 
then the iron curtain comes down and the creative juices are no longer there. Now the business shit comes in and, um, and then I can't really focus on the creative aspect of it, but I'm different. I'm a different kind of person. It's my job. Then it's no longer fun and free. Now I have a time limit and I have, you know, I don't want to have a time limit. I just want to why. Well, that's yeah. And that's Uh why the, the, that portion of my website uh, that we're, that I'm calling loyal Oak artists, uh, can work very well for you because you can just paint whenever you feel like it. And then we post right. a good photograph of that piece on there and then there it is. And then if someone is interested, right. if someone is interested and they want to buy it, then I'll put them in, in touch with you. And that's right. how that but can then, work. Then again, I, I also take commission work. I mean, I have, you know, somebody that will call me and say, Hey, can you paint a picture of this? I need it by this time. Uh, usually I can do that and that's not a problem. But you uh, just want to choose the, frequency of those transactions i want to choose the frequency of it because if i'm constantly doing it then i'll get me personally i can't speak for any other artist but i'll get burnt out at it i work with oils and it's a frustrating medium to work with so i can't uh i can't really get supported all that but i am happy to do commissions you know and and if they call me and say listen you know my husband has a birthday coming up in november can you paint this sure enough i can i'll happily do it so like i just do it Really? Yeah. Well, I'm looking to facilitate that process and make it easier for artists like yourself and uh, some of the other friends that I have and other people that I know, make it easier for myself as well. You know, just a meeting place where people can collaborate and advertise Mm -hmm. their wares in one gathered spot. Online. Right. And then maybe we can actually, you know, work together and have, you know, an exhibition together. If there's like three or four of us artists, you know, I know I'm too broke to rent out one building to show my work. But if we're four people renting out one building, uh, maybe it's a little more affordable, you know. So yeah. I'm willing to work with other artists to uh, have an exhibit or or to to really come together. And I like all different kinds of art, you know, so uh, I think it'd be a good idea. I like this idea on your on your page. It's a way for us to lift each other up. And I think that's important. Every once in a while, I have a reasonable thought. Every once in a while. <laughs> it happens. It happens. <laughs> on occasion. On occasion. <laughs> I wonder what that's like. <laughs> you wonder what that's like. <laughs> Well, you know, it happens too rare for me to be able to put words on it. So uh, you'll have to ask somebody <laughs> else, Chris. <laughs> oh, well, for me, a reasonable thought is when I decide not to have frozen pizza for dinner. Oh, <laughs> preach that shit. Do you, do you cook, do you cook good meals for yourself, Chris? Or I mean, being on the road like you are, do you find it hard to keep your nutrition up? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the things you notice with with people who do travel a lot for work is that, you know, you, you're not necessarily eating the way you should be. So it's funny in, in this lockdown, I've actually lost five kilo and okay. I've been cooking more and, you know, eating more regularly and not frozen pizza. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So it, it's been fun. I, I actually was... Um, on my way to the grocery store, you know, and, and, uh, I put on clean jeans, uh, forgot to put on a belt and I was halfway there and I was like, my pants! <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the opposite route, man. I got the quarantine 15 because I'm at home cooking. I'm a Southern girl, you know, so <laughs> we had fried chicken and mashed taters yesterday. You know, with biscuits. So uh, I think, I think this quarantine time has been worse for me because I'm cooking. At home. I, it's, can it's, you, it's not okay. Can you just say biscuits again? Just say it. Let me hear Biscuits, biscuits. Oh, you gotta see. have some biscuits. <laughs> yeah. And biscuits and gravy. You know, you fried chicken. Oh, gosh. Beans. I'm getting homesick. I'm getting homesick now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I tell you, I, I am, uh, these days, I am constantly, constantly homesick. You know, everything is fine right here in Norway, but gosh, do I want to be at home. I just miss, I don't know. I miss home. I miss home. I miss home. I miss home too, but I don't think I would want to be home in these quarantine times because uh, the, the thing I miss about home, like I don't have any close relationship with my family or let's just say relatives. Yeah. I, I, have relatives I have relatives and then I have my family, but my family, like they're kind of spread out and that would be requiring me to go to several different homes. So I wouldn't be allowed to go to several different homes. So I'd be stuck in my own house. But then again, my own house was on the goddamn beach with palm trees. So I, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, 
<laughs> Do you get homesick, Chris? <laughs> oh yeah. You know, and it's, it's funny because, um, so I'd moved here in, in the, the winter of 2001 and my very first time back visiting in the U S I landed in Boston on September the 10th. And, uh, in the, the two weeks that I was there after, you you could palpably feel the country changing into something angry. And, mm-hmm. and you know, it was that, that seed being planted of what we have today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the things that I miss, um, you know, they're, they're actually the things that I try to nurture here, you know, because they're portable, you know, like openness compassion engagement um, hugging strangers hugging yeah. strangers yeah yeah. Oh, yeah yeah no i don't i don't hug strangers that much but you know the, the, things, that, the things that i missed and valued from where i was from are the things that i try to nurture in my kids you yes. know and you know i see them taking that their kindness to strangers their kindness to the elderly in our neighborhood isn't that a beautiful thing Um, isn't that a beautiful thing those are the things that you teach your kids that you want to see them put on display yeah yeah you know and so when they come down to oslo and you know i introduce them to my friends here you know they they engage in a conversation they don't hide behind me you know you know and and so you know and and when they come down here because you know i'll be honest it's it's a bit of a monoculture in sure. Heidel. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, they come to also and it's like the whole spectrum and yeah. it's, you know, and they see me engaging with my friends from all different countries and they, they think that's interesting and exciting and something that they want to be a yeah. part of. So, yeah. you know, the, it's, um, you know, the weather where I'm from is exactly the same as here. So it's, yeah. I don't have that conundrum Tiffany has, uh, but fuck you, Chris. <laughs> fuck you, fuck you all the way. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but yeah. Well, listen, I, um, I really enjoyed having this, uh, this, this little talk with you two. Um, absolutely. You know, I, Tiffany, this is what the fourth time you've been on. So you, uh, at least, yeah, I just about yeah. need to get, get a chair here beside me with your name on it. You can start, <laughs> <laughs> but and, I, miss, and, I miss speaking in the microphone though. I do. I miss the, uh, the, yeah. the being next to you and talking and getting that, but yeah. at least we do this like of this video chat thing and I can yeah. still see your face yeah. and the Ooh. conversation can still be kind of real, yeah. even though we're Part. And and Chris, I really I really enjoyed getting to know you better. I tell you, when when um, we had a little bit of contact some months ago, you and I, Chris, yeah. and nothing really came of it as far as us getting together. But when this uh, isolation and things are lifted uh, and we can travel a little bit better, man, I need to come out there and see you and hang out a little bit. Yeah, come, come to also. I'll show you all of this magic. All of this oh, magic. All, all of it. this. All <laughs> of it. <laughs> Uh, no, so I just she was she was here really quick. They people can't see the this hand gesture that we're making. And poor Tiffany <laughs> came to Oslo once to visit, and like right away we were outside having a drink, and she's like, "Oh, it's so good to be in Oslo." And I was like, "Oh yes, all all of, of this." <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Oh, the fantasticness oh. of it. Yes. Well, I I really enjoyed having both you on. Absolutely. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks for having me on again, John. You know, now I'm, I'm always happy to come and have a chat with you. It's my pleasure. It's is my pleasure. Mm-hmm. Chris Pelser and Tiffany Troutman, everybody. I want to thank you all for tuning into this episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Bye, everybody. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Yes, I am, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Lord, I'm coming home.